All right. Well, welcome here. Let's get us started. And uh, this will be the, uh, I think the last of my videos this uh, summer. Uh, because this is the replacements of the lab. And so uh, we uh, want to go through these answers and I want to get this to you as, as soon as you can so you can use that studying tonight or tomorrow morning before the final exam. All right, so uh, let, let me run through this. Uh, I'll start off with this first one. The first one is a definition really. It says, what is the period of the minute hand on a clock? Now remember, the period is the time for one cycle all the way around. So the minute hand takes an hour to go around, and so I guess the answer is C, uh, one hour. Of course, the minute hand measures minutes, so don't, don't, don't get misled by, by that, but it takes one hour to make a full uh, cycle. Uh, here it says a bob oscillates on a vertical spring, so something's going up and down. Okay. Um, if the frequency of the motion is two cycles in one second, its period is. And so one of the things we learned is that they are reciprocal. So if we have a frequency of two, the reciprocal would be a half. And so D would be the answer for number two. Uh, increasing, which of the following causes an increase in the period of the, of the pendulum? And so the pendulum was this square root of L over G and made a big deal during the lecture of Galileo's discovery that the uh, amplitude or the mass uh, didn't change it. Um, what changed it would be the length and also, I guess, the strength of gravity. Now, we couldn't really do that, but it, it's, it's an option here. But it says increasing which of the following. So if you increase the length, you would increase the period. So length is what they're, they're looking for. Increasing the strength of gravity would actually decrease the period. It's in the denominator. So uh, the period's affected by these two, but increasing length would also increase period. Okay, number four, then, when a wave travels from one place to another, what is transported? Ah, now that hopefully you see as energy. That, that was the, the, the whole idea of um, the, the definition, if you will, of a, of a wave, that the energy moves, not the mass. And so it's not A or B, and of course something moves, so it wouldn't be D. Oh, while standing on the dock, you observe water waves passing beneath you, Okay. Uh, if you observe 20 waves crest passing below you in two minutes. Now, let me pause you right there. That, that's a frequency, right? That, that, that's a, 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 a rate. It's 20 waves passing below you in two minutes. So maybe I'll put 120 seconds. So 20 waves in 120 seconds seconds. You judge the crest to be one meter apart. Okay, so that's a description of the wavelength. What is the period of the wave? Okay, so the period is the reciprocal of the frequency. So I guess we don't even need that. We just need to take the reciprocal of this, which I guess we can cut the twos down. We can write that to 1 over 6. And so when you take the reciprocal, you get a, a 6. So this would be C. Cool. Okay. Uh, sound waves are... Okay, and if you remember, we kind of had this uh, breakdown of waves into transverse and longitudinal. And we said, you know, sound waves are one atom hitting another, hitting another, hitting another. So they vibrate in the direction they move. That's the definition of longitudinal waves. And so sound waves are a form of longitudinal waves. Uh, here you see lightning before you hear the thunder because, ah, now this is a combination of our uh, sound waves and our light waves, and so you have this lightning bolt, if you will, and what comes from it is both light and sound. And light, we said, was about three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, really, really fast. Sound is still 
pretty fast, but incredibly slow compared to the speed of light. So I would guess the best way to uh, say this is that you see the lightning before because the speed of sound is faster. No, 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 no. The speed of light is faster. Yes. Thunder forms after the light. No, no, no. They, 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 they're, they're one and the same. Uh, your eyes are more sensitive. No, 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 no. Okay, so speed of light is faster. So number seven would be B. And then the last one on this first page, uh, if we compare the speed of a periodic sound wave that has a frequency of 220 hertz to that of a wave of 440 hertz, so twice the frequency, the 220 hertz wave is moving blank as to the, ah, and uh, hopefully you remember that experiment we did on, on, on sound waves. Uh, and even in class where we said the velocity depended on temperature, the velocity did not depend upon the frequency. So all the frequencies travel at the same speed. And so that's why we did the second half of the, uh, the uh, standing wave one where we measured the speed of sound at one frequency. I think it was around uh, 749 if I remember right. Um, and then we do a, a, another one that is... Well, it's supposed to be double and then the speaker didn't sound well. So it was a little bit... Uh, lower than that. So, anyways, that's the first page, if you will. All right, so moving on to the next page here, I guess number nine. It says here, the pitch of sound is primarily determined by, and then this would be B frequency. That's, again, your brain tells you uh, the frequency, the physics of it is different frequencies, and so it gets registered in your brain in what you would call a pitch or, or, or a tone. Uh, number 10, uh, the wavelength corresponding to the fundamental frequency on a guitar string is blank times the length of the, of the string. So uh, a string, if you remember, uh, was a, this type of pattern where we tied it on, on both ends, and we could have either what we called mode one, n equal to one, so that's one hump. Uh, but we could have other ones on the string, but since this says fundamental, that's as far as we need to go. This would be the second harmonic, what we call mode number two. Um, but the fundamental one would be here, and that would represent half a wavelength. In fact, that's the one I kept saying during the lecture that it's kind of hard to Picture that as a whole wave because you're only seeing half of the of the wave. So if the string has a length L, you would say L is a half a, a wavelength. Or to put another way, then the wavelength is twice the length. And that, so that's what it says. The fundamental frequency of a guitar string is blank times the length of the of the string. So it looks like 10 is D twice the, the length of the string. Uh, more on light here. Uh, a laser beam is shown across the room. While the spot on the wall is visible to you, you cannot see the beam between the laser and the wall because... And so this was that beginning part of our optics where it said, hey, you you got to get the, the light going to your eyes. And so uh, it needs a vacuum to be visible. I don't really know what that means. Um... The light needs to enter your eyes to be visible. That sounds like the key there. Uh, needs to chemically react. No. Uh, does not turn red until it hits the wall. No, no. I don't, I don't even know what that exactly means. But it needs to enter your eyes. And so if it just goes through the air, there's nothing for it to bounce off and go to your eyes. And so that's why I put during the lecture that, that smoke in the air. Uh, which letter corresponds to the location of the image uh, of the object O? So here's O. And so we said that for a flat mirror, um, and it doesn't use the word flat mirror, but I, but I hope that's what you got out of this straight line. It's a mirror. It's, it's flat. And uh, if you were standing, it doesn't really matter where you stand or exactly where you stand. Let's just put a little person right here. 
because we learned that, and we wrote it this way, that the distance of the image is the same as the distance of the object, and it was a virtual image, so it was the same distance back in. And so it would be D, that's, you know, if the mirror extended. You could see it a little better, but even if it doesn't extend it, it's still there, and that's probably what makes this problem a little bit harder than what I did in class, because what I did in class is I had the full mirror, and I, I put my object right here, and I made one beam bounce and go like this, and I made the other beam hit and go straight back, and then I said, well, that top beam would appear to come from here, this angle down would appear to come from here, and then we proved that those had to be congruent triangles, and so if we called that the object distance and that the image distance, we proved they were the same because they were congruent. Uh, but the same would also be true even if you didn't have a mirror there, and so, I mean, a, a mirror all the way down, and so that might make it a little harder if you drew a ray that bounced off and went like that, and maybe a second ray that hit the mirror and bounced off like this. These would be the two going to your eyes, and we only need to draw two of them, uh, and I just drew these two because they were, you know, this one was real easy, and then this one could be anything, um, but if two of them were at an angle, it would still look like this one that bounced off and, and did that. So I drew these two. Clearly that one wouldn't actually happen because it doesn't bounce off the, off the mirror. So uh, you would probably do the math this way. And so I'm spending a, quite a bit of time here showing you that it, it's actually going to come out to be the same thing, but uh, that's going to take some thought. So uh, hopefully that uh, worked well for you, but if not, I kind of get it, and so that 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 could be a tough one. But the answer is uh, is D, um, and position D is is D. All right. Ah, here's another flat mirror. It says the shortest mirror at which a creature from outer space can see its entire body is. And again, because of that law of re reflection, it's actually uh, half its size. Uh, I don't have much room to draw here, but maybe I'll do something like this. Here's a mirror. I'll just make it a long mirror for a second. And so here is a creature. And it doesn't have to be from outer space or anything fancy. But for you to see your feet, it has to come and hit the mirror and bounce off and hit your eyes. And putting your eyes near the, the top then... And because of the law of reflection, this angle would have to be the same as that angle. And if you made a triangle here and a triangle here, this is a right triangle. And again, these two angles would be equal because of the law of reflection, which would make those equal. And then they share this side. So we would have angle side angle to show that these two are congruent. And so that would say that this height here is the same as this height here. And so all you really need in order to see yourself is from this point up. You, you don't even need that part of the mirror. The same thing in reverse, although I kind of did this as if my eyes were on the top of my head, but if I did it and realized the eyes aren't exactly at the top of your head, then you wouldn't need this part of the mirror. Of course, if your eyes aren't exactly at your head, this would come down a little bit. But either way, then, this is half the size of the, of the creature. So it doesn't matter how close you stand, how far you stand. It doesn't matter if you're an outer space creature. It, none of that really matters. A flat mirror needs to be at least half your size. And, of course, then you have to stand at the perfect spot. Because if your head was... Um, or if the mirror was positioned too high, you wouldn't be able to see your feet, or too low wouldn't be your feet. That's why what they call full-length mirror, most full-length mirrors, if you walk into Home Depot and say, you know what, I want a full-length mirror so I can put it on my bathroom door so I can see my whole outfit at one time, uh, they're about the three-quarters the size of a human. Um, that way, you don't have to get it positioned just in a perfect spot, reasonable spot, and you can see your whole body. But it definitely doesn't have to be the size of your whole body. And it could be as small as half of your body if, if things were, were just right. Anyway, so the answer to 13 then would be uh, C. And then the last one on this page, let's see, a ray of light parallel to the optic axis of a convex mirror. Okay, so here's the convex mirror, here's the optical axis. 
it says a ray of light parallel, so one that goes parallel would bounce off, and we were saying in class, as if it came from this magical spot called the focal point, and it says uh, the convex mirror is reflected back through the center of curvature. No, 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 not through the center of curvature, through the focal, no, not through it. It doesn't actually go through it. Parallel, no, it's D as if it came from the focal point. All right, so there would be D. All right, on to page number three here. It says, what type of mirror would you use to produce a magnified image of your face? Now, if you remember in a class, I, caught, I kept calling it the boring mirror and the fun mirror. The fun mirror did three different things, where the boring mirror, which was the convex, always did the same thing. But the concave mirror made things bigger upside down. It also made them bigger right side up. It also made them smaller upside down. The other one, the, the what I called the boring mirror, the convex mirror, only made it smaller and only made it right side up. So if you want to magnify... You gotta go with concave. Concave is the only thing that, of those two mirrors, that's the one that makes it bigger. And you could even make it bigger upside down or bigger right side up. Ah, now, into some refraction here. Um, a narrow beam of light emerges from a block of glass in the direction as shown. Okay, so it emerges. So it looks like the arrowheads are saying it's in the glass and it's coming into the air and it's gonna be uh, looks like that direction. Which arrow best represents the path of the beam inside of the glass? Well, hopefully, hopefully you ruled out C because that was a whole idea of refraction. It's, it's not going to be going in a straight line. And the whole idea of refraction was a speed change. And so it would come from the slower material, glass, and this outer edge, which if you're riding along, I'd call it the right edge, comes out first. So this right edge goes fast, left edge goes slow, so it turns to the left or away from the normal, as I was describing it in class. So it should look a little bit like this. And so that would be uh, B, then, for the direction that it would go here. So B would be a, the best description of it. Ah, uh, now here's that the spectrum, the the Roy G. Biv. I said it's an easy way to remember the uh, the color of the uh, rainbow. We did it in class. We we did it on the spectrum lab, and so Roy G. Biv is <laughs> funny answer a cowboy singer. <laughs> uh, no, uh, famous scientist. Uh, no, uh, mnemonic for remembering the colors of the rainbow. Yes, that's it in a way to remember how images are formed. No, no. Ah, uh, here's a good one. Yeah, here's one we, we talked about. Uh, oh, I thought this was a color one. No, uh, no, this is not the color one. Oh, this is the uh, uh, dispersion. Um, and so they bend, and they bend to the, the speed change, um, but the violet light travels the slowest, just a hair slower than uh, the red, and uh, whoops, a little faster. And so when the light emerges, it, it basically follows this path. It doesn't matter what color it is, it basically follows this path, but there is a slight difference. If this is a, a violet light, it will have a bigger speed change and then a slightly bigger angle compared to the red. So if this is the red, then this is the, the violet. And so that process of traveling at different speeds between violet and red is called dispersion. And it is also um, resulting in, a, in an angle change. In fact, that's what both of these are, just reading ahead. In fact, maybe I'll do 19 first because th this is it. It says, when white light passes through a prism, it is spread out into its rainbows of colors. This effect is known as dispersion. Okay, and so the dispersion really is this uh, 
slight, very, very slight, and uh, you, it's not really even noticeable with the eye, unless you're at a, a, a big enough angle like, like D here that it really has enough spread that you get a, get a rainbow. Uh, and so water does that. So that's the, the reason you get a rainbow is this dispersion. And so I kind of got ahead of myself here, but that's what 18 is, a dispersion effect, but it says assuming the following colors of light pass through the, the spectrum, which color of ray is bent the most? And again, as I was saying, violet goes the slowest of all of them. So as it goes from violet, uh, the violet, when it goes from glass into air, changes the most. And so it would bend the most and the reds the least. Now, I'm looking here, and they don't have violets, okay. But going through the spectrum, if it's not violet, the next would be indigo, which isn't listed. The next would be blue, which is listed. And so blue would be the most. I guess after that would be green, after that would be yellow, and last would be, well, next would be orange, not listed, and then the next would be, would be red. All right, and then one more, and it looks like it goes back to uh, sound here. It says, which of the following has the most effect on the speed of sound? And so that's what we said earlier would be uh, the temperature. Uh, making it an amplitude, that just makes it louder. It doesn't change its speed. And then as we said, those two would compensate and change accordingly to always get the same speed. So it was the the uh, temperature that affected the speed. All right, so there's the, the multiple choice. On to the free response. Uh, looks like this takes us all the way back to 15. It says a girl of mass 40 kilograms is swinging on a rope of length 2.5 meters. So it's like a giant swing. Uh, what is her frequency? And so the period is 2 pi over the square root of L over G. Uh, 2 pi, the length, they say, is 2.5 meters. G, we can kind of roughly do as 10. Or we can use 9.8 and grab a calculator. Like, let me grab a calculator. I think I'm going to be needing that real, real soon. But this made it nice because this, then, is 2 pi. And then this is just 1 quarter. And the square root of 1 quarter, then is one half, and one half and two just leave you with pi. So the period is pi, but they we're not quite done because it says what is the frequency. All right, so the frequency is the reciprocal of the period, and so one over pi would be one way to give the answer. It might be better to give a fraction, give a decimal here, and so one divided by pi is 0.318, so 0.318 hertz. So about a third of a, uh, of a cycle in, in one second. So as they're kind of swinging back and forth, it would, in a, you know, how much of a swing? It's about a third of a swing in one, one second. So if the girl swung from here to the other height and then back, That'd be one cycle. Uh, the frequency of one third, so so from here to here, would be about a third of a swing, and then that would be the next third, and then that would be the last third. So there's the swing. So you would see her go from the top and about down to the bottom and about halfway up the other side. All right. Uh, in 22, it says you observe 30 crests of a water wave pass you each minute. Uh, that sounds like a frequency. Uh, frequency is you got 30 waves, so 30 crests, in one minute, which I guess I will write as 60 seconds. So that reduces to one half of a wave per second, or maybe just a half a hertz. Now, if the distance between each of the crests, and so is 10 meters, so... Distance between crest is a wavelength, so you have a wavelength. What is the speed? Ah, so the speed, velocity is wavelength times frequency. So wavelength is 10 meters, as we just said. Frequency is one half of a hertz. 
and uh, 10 times a half is a five. And then this would be meters. And then uh, instead of writing hertz, I'll say what a hertz means, which is a per second. And so maybe I should circle that. So uh, the speed would be five meters per, per second. Um, now the next one, which is again is a, is a distance, how far, but in meters, does light travel in one year? And so part of this is really going back to just our basic mechanics, distances, velocity times time. But the other thing to put in here is that we're talking about light. So this would be the speed of light. The symbol we used is C. And so that number here is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Now, to get this to come out in meters per second, I will need time in seconds. It says one year, so maybe I'll start off by putting 365 days. But now we go back to chapter one and realize, well, there are 24 hours in a day. So when I multiply those two, that's how many hours I have. And then, of course, there are 60 minutes in an hour, so the hours would cancel. So when I multiply these three together, I'd have the number of minutes. So finally then, if I go 60 seconds in a minute, the minutes would cancel off. And so these four multiplied together is the number of seconds. And then multiplying that by the speed is gonna give me my answer. So three times 10 to the eighth, for the speed times the 365 times the 24 times the 60 and times another 60 comes out to be 9.46 times 10 to the 15 meters. So a long distance, obviously. That's why we call it a light year. The distance light travels in one year. Although that wouldn't be in meters, so can't give an answer of one light year. we got to get in meters. Uh, 24. Uh, 24 says, how much time does it take to sound for to travel the 40,000 kilometers around the world? This is you know, like the American Revolution. The shot heard around the world. Uh, but it was literally heard around the world. I mean, how long would it take? And I would say, let's come back up here to our mechanics, distance, velocity, and time. And if you rearrange it, time then would be distance over velocity. Now the distance is the 40,000. Now they say kilometers, but if you go ahead and let me replace kilometer with what the K means, which is a thousand, this is actually then 40 million meters for the distance around the Earth. And then, of course, we need the velocity. And so now we're talking about sound. And so sound is about 344 meters per second. 344 meters per second. And so grabbing my calculator, 40, and then I've got million. One, two, three, one, two, three divided by 344 comes out to be, wow, 100, 116,279 seconds. And it's fine to leave it that way, although I kind of would like a little more understanding of it, so maybe I'll divide that by 60. So that's how many minutes, and maybe I'll divide that by 60. And so we're looking about 32 and a third hours. So 32 and a third hours. So more than a day, more than 24 hours for the sound to go all the way around the world. Uh, the fifth one here, number uh, 25, uh, it says, uh, how long is an open uh, organ pipe with a fundamental frequency of? And this is kind of like the guitar string we did. But the guitar string we did earlier, uh, we tied it and the ends were notes. Uh, this one by saying open means the air can freely move 
And so the end is an anti-node, and the other end is an anti-node. And if you remember this from class, the, the lecture of anti-node to anti-node is actually the, 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 the same uh, setup and mathematical setup as it was from node to node. So drawing maybe a, a picture, and so I'll do a dotted line here and maybe a dotted line here. Anti-node to the next anti-node would look like that. So when this is up, this is down. And a moment later, this would be down and this would be up. But either way, if this is the length, the length then would be half a, a wavelength. Okay. And so here's what we're, we're looking for. It says, how long is this or, organ pipe? And so that's it. It's half a wavelength. But we, at this point, don't know the wavelength. We know the frequency. So we do need to say that the wavelength, then, would be velocity divided by frequency. So I'll take the standard speed of sound, 344 meters per second, and divide it by a frequency of 512 hertz. And remind myself that a hertz is a per second, so I'm going to be left with meters. Uh, grab my calculator here and go 344 divided by 512. And so that would be a wavelength of 0.672 meters. So now I can take half of 0.672 meters. And so times a half. And I get about a 336. So 0.336 meters should be the length of the, of the tube. All right, and uh, one more page here. And so what then is the frequency of a tuning fork that has a, a period? And although this is asking about sound waves, it really carries all the way back to chapter 15. Sound waves was in 16, but this also carries to 17. They're just reciprocals of each other. Uh, and so this would be 1 over the period. And it looks like the, the period is pretty small, 0 0.0005 seconds. And so 1 divided by 0 0.0005 is 2,000. And 2,000 in our units would be per second, which we call a hertz. So 2,000 hertz. And you might remember the one in class I had actually was about this tall and kind of thick and I hit it and it was 1,024 hertz. So, so this would be even a higher frequency than that and that was, was, was pretty high. This, this is in that range when I went through the speakers, it just kind of sounded obnoxious. So that would be an obnoxious one, but fortunately we don't have to listen to it. Uh, here, what is the wavelength of the music note that has a frequency of 256? This is about middle C on a, on a keyboard. Um, and so the wavelength uh, would be the velocity divided by the frequency. Again, it's sound, so it's about 343 meters per second. And the middle C is roughly 256 hertz. Uh, those would cancel off, leaving you with uh, meters. And we did a calculation like this earlier, so hopefully both cases you got them right. Uh, but it looks like a wavelength of about 1.34 meters for the wavelength of the, of the sound. Uh, here, the fundamental frequency of a 60 centimeter long guitar string has this frequency. What is the speed of the waves on the guitar string? Now, be careful here, as I put a little hint here. No, I'm not talking about the speed of the, of the sound. You know, a guitar has waves on the string which, of course, its purpose is to vibrate the waves on the string, so then that would vibrate the wood, and the wood would vibrate the air, so then it makes sound waves. So. Uh, maybe one of the trickier things about this problem is to, to be careful and realize the guitar has really two waves. We could talk about the speed of the sound waves that are produced, which we would know that is 340, 
345 or 344 meters per second at normal room temperature. But we could also talk about the speed of the waves on the guitar string, and that's what this one is asking. So the velocity would be the wavelength times the frequency. And they gave the frequency straight up. So we know that number. The wavelength takes a little bit more thought, but uh, going back to our discussions on the standing uh, waves and the fundamental wave, trying to look over here where I drew that, 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 that picture. Uh, I know I recently did a sound tube, uh, but we also did a, a wave drawing back on number 10 right here, where if you're talking about the fundamental one, you just got one little hump here from node to node. And so the wavelength is twice the, the length of the, of the string. All right, so using that, I could say that the length of the, or the wavelength would be twice this at 120 centimeters. And then if I also be careful with my units here, that is 1.2 meters times 483 hertz is then going to make a unit of meter per second. And now I just got to grab my calculator and go 1.2 times 483, and I'll just round it to 580 meters per second. So that's the speed. And again, it's the waves of the, on the guitar. It is not the speed of the, of the sound waves. So, so that so that could be a little bit hard. I know. Hopefully, this hint made it a little bit uh, easier because there was kind of quite a bit going on there. And then these are just like the homework. And fortunately, I had done the geometry for you, so hopefully, they're not too bad. But it says here, if an object is placed twenty centimeters, so this would be the d sub o, the distance of the object from the, and we need to know what kind of mirror, convex mirror, with a focal length of. 15, uh, where is the image? And so one of the equations we worked out with this geometry was that your first step would be taking what's given, okay? And in this case, the uh, focal length and the object distance and we're not directly given the height of the object. So because of that, we can't really calculate the height of the image. But that's okay. They're not asking for the height of their image. They're asking for its location. So let me solve for this, what I'd call this ratio. So the focal length is 15 centimeters. And then, of course, if I add these two together, that's 35 centimeters. And so grabbing my calculator, this is 35 divided, I'm saying 15 divided by 35. And that's then a 0.429. And so notice it's less than one. And that's what we said about the convex mirror. We said the convex mirror would, would always make an upright and smaller image. And so it's, it's almost, not quite, but almost half the, the size. It's a little, little smaller than, than half the size. So if I knew this object height was, say, four, I'd move it over to here and then go four times that and get something a little bit under two. But I don't. But that's okay because the way they asked the question, I don't need to know because the other equation we worked out was this ratio the height of the image is to the height of the object, is the focal length minus distance image over focal length. So although we don't know that one individually, we know this ratio. And so let me take this and put it into here, 0 0.429. Uh, let me put in my 15 for the focal length. And now the only unknown in this is the distance of the, of the image. And that's exactly what I'm, I'm trying to solve for. Where is the image? That is the image distance. And so I need to do a, a, a couple of uh, steps here. Uh, maybe I'll do them one at a time. 
and just move the 15 over. So if I take that and multiply by 15, I get a 6.4, uh, what do I call it, a 4, 3. And then to finish, I'll move the image distance over to there, and then I will have a 15 minus that last answer. So if I put this into my calculator, 15 minus the last answer gives me a image distance of 8.57, and I've been doing everything in centimeters. And so, oops, am I off the screen? Let me move it over here. And so there is the distance in the, uh, the image distance, 8.57. Okay, and then finally this, this last one, and now we're on to the concave mirror. And on that one, we worked out the geometry. And there were two of them, so we need to be careful which geometry we're, we're talking about. But uh, as I read it here, it says an object is placed 35 from a concave mirror of focal length of 15. So we said watch that focal length because we would have a set of equations if it was more than the focal length and a different set of equations if it was less than the focal length for the concave mirror. And in this case, we are greater than the focal length. And so the two equations look to something like, like this. This is the first one. And the second one was the height of the image is to the object as image distance minus focal is equal to the focal. And again, it's the same type of question as up here. Where is the image? And so the, the first thing here, I should have put an O there, sorry. And so the first thing is to come over here and then put a 15. And the object distance is now 35 and then minus 15. And so we've got a 15 over 20, uh, which I guess reduces to 3 fourths when you divide by 5, which is 0.75. So like the, the one I mentioned uh, before up here, I can't really solve explicitly for the height of the uh, image because I don't know the height of the object, but at least I know that ratio. So I can use it in the other equation right here. So that's a 0.75 for that whole ratio. And then this is the unknown I'd like to find, the position of the image. And the focal length here is 15, and the focal length here is, is 15. And so, again, maybe doing the math in two steps, I'll take the 0.75 and multiply it by the 15, and this comes out to be 11.25. And then maybe moving the 15 now over, so that becomes plus, and so add 15, I get 26.25, and I've been doing everything in centimeters, so 26.25 centimeters, and maybe I should circle that one, and circle that one, and that's the end of the test, and I, I hope you did well on it, and uh, like I said, review this because these are the kind of things you will see um, on, the, uh, on the final tomorrow. And uh, good luck.